Ho, ho, ho. Welcome back to D and C in 23 with half of WP. I'm Dave, and we are here to talk about Tuesday, June 27th at Deer Creek in Noblesville, Indiana. What a show. Let's get on with it. This was Dead & Company's sixth and final time playing this venue, the Ruoff Music Center, a.k.a. the Ruoff Home Mortgage Music Center, a.k.a. Deer Creek in Noblesville, Indiana, a suburb of Indianapolis about 30 minutes north of Indy. The Grateful Dead also frequented this venue uh, during their later years. So they, the Grateful Dead played 14 shows here in Noblesville between 1989 and 1995. Coincidentally, Deer Creek was the last one-stop shop that the Grateful Dead played at back in 1995. They played Noblesville, Indiana, and then the Grateful Dead did a two-night stand in St. Louis and a two-night stand in Chicago. Uh, So here, up in 2023, this is the last one-stop shop for Dead & Company. They'll go three nights in Colorado, two at the Gorge in Washington State, and then three nights in San Fran. So kind of funny how that works out. Uh, Time is a flat circle, and uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. For those interested, that Deer Creek uh, 95 show by the Dead was the last Scarlet Fire the Grateful Dead ever played. So if you're interested, go check that out. But more importantly, check out what they played last night, June 27th. The set list, set one, Bertha into Good Lovin', It Must Have Been the Roses, A True Big River, none of this big river music with Dark Star teases that they did in Fenway, a true big river into a Dark Star on the Big River jam uh, with the second verse of Dark Star being sung over the continuation of Big River. And then a ripping Next Time You See Me into Mississippi Mississippi Half Step, into Birdsong, and then a Don't Ease Me In set closer. This first set, man, hot, hot, hot. Uh, I did something I had yet to do this tour, and I purchased the uh, video stream for the whole show. And so I got to watch what they were doing in addition to playing. So I have a lot of notes. Let's talk about set one. For the Bertha opener, hot guitar playing by Mare. I mean, he he set the tone for what's going to be the theme the whole night, really. Um, And some good, upbeat, grooving stuff from O'Teal. It was just just pleasant, that's all. Just a pleasant Bertha. Got people bouncing. And then they played that that good notes of good loving to start. And Bob's voice was already teetering a little bit for, you know, the good loving. And when he hit the end of the first verse, that what's ailing me, he reached a little on his voice and he hit the notes. And he did this big smile, I think because he didn't know if his voice was going to deliver or not. And then it did deliver. And then he took it to the next level because he was like, all right, well, if I can hit that, I can hit these falsetto notes too. So he fucking rode that wave near the end of the song. Gotta admit, it sounded really good. He was, he was crushing it. There were reports that his voice was a little tired and worn out coming off the two night run in Fenway. And he... He delivered here with, you know, going falsetto early in the show. Sandwiched in between all that was an excellent organ solo from Kimenti. Uh He shone all song and just took this good love into the next level. And it built up into a really nice ending segment um, that had some good strong plan with Bob continuing to crush falsetto. And then the band slowed it all the way down for It Must Have Been The Roses, uh, for a slow bluesy crawl. I had sweet playing from Kementi and a nice moment right before the second chorus where O'Teal and Kementi musically like walked it down together to ramp John Mayer into that I don't know uh, for the chorus. And then one of the most controversial songs all tour, Big River, comes out next in full. Uh, Kementi continued to crush it. He was just going nuts on the organ. Uh, 
And then about halfway through his solo, if you watch the video or if you are fortunate enough to go to a show where they show it on the screen, Kementi tinkers and plays with the settings on the organ the entire show. He, his ear, he is like making little micro adjustments as he does it hundreds of times as the show goes on, um, including while he's doing a solo, he'll take one hand off the keys and, you know, either turn a knob or pull a lever, you know, he, he tinkers constantly. And uh, he did about halfway through this big river solo too. He was playing really fast, jamming really hard. And then he went up to the right end, like the high end on the piano, and he turned something and it gave his organ some extra stank to finish out the, the big river key solo. And I thought that was going to be the end of the song when that key solo wrapped up. But Bob stepped up to the mic and he, he signaled to keep it going. He waved his hands in like a circular motion as if to say like, hey, jam this out a little longer, like keep it going. And part of what he was jamming out was the I'm going to sit right here until I die line. I think that might have had a little extra meaning. Alex has pointed this out before with late period Jerry and then some of the Dead & Company slower ballads that Bob will sing where the message is, um, you know, I'm not going to be around for much longer. Like Death Don't Have No Mercy is an example that comes to mind. With some of these songs about the end of life, and, you know, seeing an, an old grizzled Bob sing them, it, it takes on a little extra poignancy. It has a little extra a little extra meaning to it. And that's kind of what I got out of this, the end of this big river, that he was, he was telling the fans, you know, I'm going to be right here until I die. I'm going to be with you until, until it's time to go. And I thought that that was going to be a good way to kind of end that, that jam suite. And then this band, man, they just, they trick you and they, they really keep you on your toes. Because as soon as I was having those kind of deep thoughts for a Dead & Company show, they go right into this dark star with a big river, you know, upbeat tone underneath. I, I've i never heard anyone sing the dark star lyrics that quickly. I mean, they were going quick with the big river music, Bob belting out the dark star lyrics. He held like this scream for 10 seconds in there that... His voice didn't waver at all. It sounded great. It, it was truly fascinating to watch John Mayer have trouble keeping up with Bob. You know, nine times out of ten, it's the other way around, where I feel like Mayer is really ready to go with the tempo, and Bob kind of has to hold him back. And this time, Mayer was, like, looking over, like, oh, geez, are we going this quick on the on this? Okay. And And that was really, really interesting to watch. The best part of all this, though, the best part of this, like, interesting, fun, dark star on the Big River Jam was that everybody on stage was beaming. Bob was, Bob had the biggest smile on his face. O'Teal was smiling, but I mean, he does that for every song. Mickey was laughing while drumming. I mean, he looked like he almost didn't even know what was going on, and it was, he was having a great time. They looked like they were truly blowing themselves away with the musical improv genius happening on that stage. And as I watched it, I went from my jaw dropping when they launched into this dark star in the big river jam to smiling along with them. And I, I was loving it when they wrapped it up, you know, it was kind of like, all right, that was a, that's going to be the fun high moment of set one. Nope. They go into a next time you see me that, I, I, somehow the music got even better. Mare ripped into this lick and everyone else grooved along on a dime. Kementi did the first solo on the electric piano and it was great. And then Mare answered him with a solo reminiscent of Jerry. He was channeling his Jerry. And then Kementi switched over to the organ and did another solo. And then Mayer answered that. He kind of, you know, turned and looked back at John Mayer. And then Mayer answered that with a definitively John Mayer-esque blue solo. That just blew the crowd away. And the entire time, the two of them were just building each other up and up, up and up. And, you know, not a song that I would normally seek out or have it be like a standout moment of the show. 
I got to say, this is the definitive Dead & Company next time you see me. I mean, this was hot from the start and just got hotter and hotter. And then when fortunate enough to watch the video, something that happened as they transitioned into Mississippi Half Step, you know, Mare is jamming to end next time you see me. And then he launched right into the Mississippi Half Step riff. And the look on his face, he had this like, oh, look with his mouth open and his eyebrows raised. Almost like he was trying to surprise Bob and O'Teal, like on exactly when he was going to flip the switch into Mississippi. And it that combined with the the Dark Star on the Big River Jam, which I should mention uh, was handwritten in to the set list, so Matt Bush did not have that planned. That was something that the band did on their own. You know, all that stuff, and then watching Mayer do this, I, the spirit of the trickster dead just embodied everybody last night in the best way. And it just made the viewing experience so much better. For the Mississippi Half Step, I mean, Mayer was on it. He stayed hot. This was some of the best work from the drummers as well in this song. Uh, they maneuvered around the licks and phrases that Mare was dropping in. Um, so they they stayed with him and they, they played the song really well. And then before you know it, after you know about five or six minutes of jamming in that, the back half, the switch in Mississippi Half Step, they were right into a bird song in a pairing that worked really, really well. And this bird song got pretty spacey, and it ended about a, a long 30-minute run of bluesy, structured heat on, on all the instruments, the guitar, the bass, and the piano. I mean, yes, there was a Dark Star jam, but it was over the Big River riff that was, you know, the pretty structured, bluesy cowboy riff. Um so this ended a, pr a pretty long stretch of of structured blues music into really spacey freeform jamming. They didn't uh, they didn't move the dial a little bit out to space. The pendulum swung all the way over to the space side, and this you know it fell apart into something magical with like echoey Bob drags on his guitar. I don't want to say slides because he wasn't. He didn't have the slide on, but he was like, you know, dragging his sliding between notes on the fretboard and with it like echoing out and some like just weird, not some uncomfortable piano playing from Kimenti. Not bad, but just, you know, kind of kept you on your toes. And then Mickey started a little pre drums warm up by going ballistic. I mean, they really got out there with this bird song. The first big or O'Teal ordinance dropped in about halfway through, and then all of a sudden they ended their trip out to space with a return to the chorus. And it it felt a little clunky, not because they didn't transition back in well, they did, but because in the span of one measure, they went from way, way out to super structured in the chorus like on a dime and it 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 was kind of a little bit of whiplash to be that far out in space to that much back in place in such a short amount of time i'll be honest i thought that that was going to be the end of the set you know they were winding bird song down and they they took it down they had such a hot set and i thought this was a good kind of spacey way to get the energy back to neutral and and into the into the set break. But no, they launched into a Don't Ease Me In set ender, which is always a lovely, pleasant surprise when this drops in. It's a great like get up and dance and get the energy back up from neutral into the set break. Uh, the drumming was good, and then Comenti was great, and then Mayer was just even better. He brought the house down to end it, and it it capped off a really, really killer set one. Just internally, I draw a little bit of comparison between this and the, the Phoenix, Arizona show. With that Phoenix show, it was like after a two-night stint in L.A., what are they going to come out to the desert with? And they came out with such a hot first set in that Arizona show back in the beginning of the tour. 
just kind of a similarity here. You know, you got the two night runs at SPAC at New York City and then at Fenway, and you got this one off stand in in the Midwest. What are they going to come out in Indiana with? And they came out with just absolute fire. Everything was was so well done and well played. And and again, I really do think that next time you see me was something special was going on with that song. The halftime show, uh, the Dead Air halftime show, was an interview with Ed Perlstein, a San Francisco photographer. I was not familiar with his work before this, uh, and if you were like me and unsure of who that is, I encourage you to go to musicimages.com, and you can see his photography collection from many rock artists, but particularly the Grateful Dead. And on the page, it's very convenient. It's sorted by band member. So, you know, you can go look at photos of your favorite artist um, and being sorted by member, you can kind of go through the eras with, you know, the Pigpen era, the God Show era, the Brent era, etc. That's pretty neat. Set two kicked off at 9.10. So they took about a 40 minute set break. And set two kicked off with a song I called and my estimated profits kicked off with Ico Ico, and then a sugary that melded into a China Cat Sunflower and I Know You Rider, into Uncle John's Band, into Drums and then Space, into Hell in a Bucket. What a post space bucket! Hell yeah. That into Wharf Rat, into Turn On Your Love Light to end set two, and then a touch of gray encore that wrapped up at about 11.04, what is what I had it wrapping up on my time. With the Ico opener, the camera opened with Marin Comenti like discussing something and then laughing about whatever they were just talking about. It's just more good vibes coming out of out of the set break. And, you know, a fun little Ico to start it off. Something that's very cool that we saw, that Alex and I saw at the Raleigh show where they played Ico, and then that I could see now was that on the video camera, it has you like walking through a tropical meadow with blue flowers and red palm trees, and it's it's a neat visual experience to see them while you dance around with you know hey now the sugary they built up a really powerful ending to the solo. What I appreciated was that John Mayer was going hard on the guitar, like he always does for Sugary, but Jane Lane was going even harder. He got into it on the drums, and it, I think, really helped Mayer launch this even harder because he had Jay Lane backing him up and kind of keeping him hot. Mayer threw out a falsetto on the last Sugary verse that like perfectly synced with the note Bob played on the rhythm guitar, and... At that point, he was just showing off. And he was like, I knew that that sugary I played was really great. Let me just put a little cherry on top. From there into China Rider, uh, a little slower on the China Cat, uh, but a good transition and a fairly long rider too. Like, uh, I would guess it was probably about double the length of the China Cat, which felt about four or five minutes. Um, I wasn't timing it, but they really jammed out the rider. And I'm really, really glad that they played China Rider tonight, and we'll talk about why uh, when we preview their next show in Colorado in a little bit. The Uncle John's band, kind of like the Donies, was a surprise for me. I thought they were going to take the rider into drums and space, but they came out with a hot Uncle Johnny. Uh, the jam near the end of this song had everything you could want. It had... Mare and Kementi like bromancing, where Mare stands right over Kementi's piano and watches him play, and then he plays something in response. Had both Mickey and Jay going wild on the kit. O'Teal flying around the fretboard. And some some excellent freeform jamming. Uh, and then at one point near the end of the song, Kementi was on the Rhodes for most of the song, and then at one point he had his left hand on his Rhodes piano and then his right hand on his normal piano. And he was like playing two piano parts at once. Just, I mean, crazy talented. Uh, the the ability to do that blows me away. I, I can't even fathom how incredibly both talented you have to be to do that. And then 
how well of a grasp you have to have on the music to do that. So just shout out to Kementi. He's, he's fucking great. And then uh, what might even be the highlight of the show, despite all the praises I sang on Next Time You See Me and the Uncle John's Band, this post-space Hell in a Bucket. What? They've been opening shows with this song. I saw them open SPAC Night 2 with it. And, and here it comes out as the post-space slot. What a beautiful surprise. I, I really thought this was an awesome spot to drop this in. And a, a shout out to Jay Lane for absolutely tearing this up. And a cool moment when Mayor kind of sensed that Jay Lane wasn't slowing down. And he turned around during his solo and walked right up to Jay's drum kit and kind of collabor- collaborated with how hot he was going to, to kick this energy up from a 10 to an 11. The Wharf Rat was pretty pretty standard, nothing really to shout out there. The Love Light, though, uh, some of Bob's best guitar playing all night. His voice was, was pretty shot by the end of Love Light, but a song that just had everybody locked in and, and having a good time, and especially the crowd. The crowd loved that they went into this after Wharf Rat. And then the Touch of Grey Encore, nice and tidy. It was a little bit of a slowed down version, uh, nothing really to... To mention, other than again, I think they wrapped it up at about 11.04 by my clock. And so if there was a curfew, you know, fuck it. Just an all-around hot show. I mean, they, other than the bird song, they never really got spacey. They never really took the pedal off the metal. They were going and going and going. And that's what they did on Tuesday the 27th. The band's next show is Saturday, July 1st at Folsom Field in Boulder, Colorado. They're doing three nights at Colorado, and we're going to try to pick what they play night one, time for estimated profits. If it's your first time with us, welcome. We will pick two songs each that they're going to play out in Colorado. I mentioned earlier I was very thankful that they played China Rider last night in in Deer Creek. Here's why. You know they're going to play I Know You Rider in Colorado. It's got that line, that cool Colorado rain, and the crowd's going to go nuts. And, you know, in prepping for this, I was like, God, are they going to do it night one? Are they going to save it till the end? Are they going to do it for the Sunday show in the middle? What are they going to do? Well, they're not going to do it for the first show i mean they just played it last night i doubt that means they do it for the middle show i think it's pretty comfortably i'm comfortable in predicting that china rider will come out for the final colorado show on monday the third so i don't have to worry about it with estimated profits um i can sit back and relax and and focus on some other songs Uh, but i don't have the first pick alex has the first pick and with his first pick he is taking a song that also references Colorado in the lyrics. He is taking Me and My Uncle, South Colorado, West Texas Bound. So that's Alex's pick. I've got the next two. I'm doing this for the first time all year because I think it's about time. Normally when I don't hit on a song on a night, I move on to other songs. And sometimes that, sometimes that bites you in the butt where they do play the song that you predicted that for the show before. So I'm sticking with a song I predicted for yesterday that they didn't play. I'm sticking with Sugar Magnolia. I think it's going to come out in any of these three nights, and I'm going to lock it into night one. My second song, taking Shakedown Street. I haven't played Shakedown in in a couple shows, so I think a Shakedown pops its way in for night one. Alex's second pick, he's got Deal. So Alex's picks, me and my uncle Deal, mine, Sugar Mag Shakedown Combo. That's going to do it for DNC in, well, not quite 23. I'm over time this time, but I was under time with my last review of Fenway Night One uh, because I was sick. So you got a couple extra minutes of DNC content out of me today. We'll be off for the next couple days, and then we'll be back on Sunday, July 2nd to break down everything that the band played on Saturday, July 1st from Boulder, Colorado. Until then, if you want to 
play along with estimated profits or let us know what's going on at those Colorado shows. If you're going to go and you're going to be boots on the ground down in Colorado, drop us a note on Twitter at working man's pod, Instagram at working man's underscore pod, or send us an email at working man's pod at gmail.com. And for playing estimated profits, you can comment on the post on the dead and company subreddit. Uh, you can find us there as well. So thanks for hanging around. If you didn't listen to this show, I hope you re-listen to it on Nugs or the Archive because it was scorching hot. And until next time in Colorado, know our love will not fade away. <laughs> <laughs>